Thank you, ma'am. We have a special guest now. This individual is familiar with national banking problems. I want you to welcome a hometown guy from Union County, the Waxhaws. Once upon a time, he was a messenger during the Revolutionary War. He defeated an invading army south of New Orleans later. Then he served as the seventh president of the United States. Most importantly, he is the only president in history to pay off the entire national debt. He considered national banks to be a threat to freedom. Please greet and welcome President Andrew Jackson. Thank you. As, uh, as my uh, speaker uh, announced, I was born near, near here in, in Waxo, not too far from here. And I also uh, taught school and, and learned the law in Salisbury, not too far from here. So it's good to be back home in North Carolina. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I understand you're going through some interesting problems right now, very similar to what was occurring when I was president. And uh, I was asked to come here today and, and give you uh, some remarks I made as I was leaving uh, the, the White House in 1837. There is perhaps no one of the powers conferred on the federal government so liable to abuse as the taxing power. Congress has no right under the Constitution to take money from the people unless it is required to execute some one of the specific powers entrusted to the government. And if they raise more than is necessary for such purposes, it is, it is an abuse of the power of taxation that is unjust and oppressive. Plain as these principles appear to be, you will yet find that there is a constant effort to induce the general government to go beyond the limits of its taxing power and to impose unnecessary burdens upon the people. Do not allow yourselves, my fellow citizens, to be misled on this subject. The federal government cannot collect a surplus for such purposes without violating the principles of the Constitution and assuming powers which have not been granted. It is moreover a system of injustice, and if persisted in, will inevitably lead to corruption and must end in ruin. There is but one safe rule, and that is to confine the general government rigidly within the sphere of its appropriate duties. It has no power to raise the revenue or impose taxes except for the purposes enumerated in the Constitution. And if its income is found to exceed these wants, it should forthwith be reduced and the burdens of the people so far lightened. In reviewing the conflicts which have taken place between the different interests in the United States, we find nothing that has produced such deep-seated evil as the course of legislation in relation to currency. The Constitution of the United States unquestionably intended to secure to the people a circulating medium of gold and silver. But experience has now proved the mischiefs and dangers of the paper currency, the paper system being founded on public confidence and having of itself no intrinsic value. It is liable to great and sudden fluctuations thereby rendering property insecure and the wages of labor unsteady and uncertain. But if your currency continues as exclusively paper as it is now, it will foster this eager desire to amass wealth without labor. It will multiply the number of dependents on bank accommodations and bank favors. The temptation to obtain money at any sacrifice will become stronger and stronger and inevitably lead to corruption which will find its way into your public councils and will destroy at no distant day the purity of your government. Some of the evils which arise from this system of paper press with particular hardship upon the class of society least able to bear it. A portion of this currency frequently becomes depreciated or worthless. It is the duty of every government so to regulate its currency and to protect this numerous class as far as practical from the impositions of avarice and fraud. It is more especially the duty of the United States where the government is emphatically the government of the people and where this respectable portion of our citizens are so proudly distinguished from the laboring class of all other nations by their independent spirit, their love of liberty, their intelligence, and their high tone of moral character. Yet it is evident that their interests cannot be effectually preceded, protected unless silver and gold are restored to circulation. Recent events have proved that the paper money system of this country may be used as an engine to undermine your free institutions. 
and that those who desire to engross all power in the hands of the few and to govern by corruption are aware of its power and prepared to employ it. The planner, the farmer, the mechanic, and the laborer all know that their success depends upon their own industry and economy and that they must not expect to become suddenly rich by the fruits of their toil. Yet these classes of society form the great body of the people of the United States. They are the bone and sinew of the country. Men who love liberty and desire nothing but equal rights and equal laws. And who moreover hold the great mass of our national wealth. The mistress springs from the power which the money interest derives from a paper currency which they are able to control. In presenting to you, my fellow citizens, these parting councils, I have brought before you the leading principles upon which I endeavored to minister the government in a high office which you twice honored me. Knowing that the path of freedom is continually beset by enemies who often assume the disguise of friends, I devoted the last hours of my public life to warn you of the dangers. The progress of the United States under our free and happy institutions has suppressed the most sanguine hopes of the founders of the Republic. It is from within, among yourselves, from cupidity, from corruption, from disappointed ambition and inordinate thirst of power, that factions will be formed and liberty endangered. It is against such designs, whatever disguise the actors may assume, that you have to especially guard yourself. He who holds in his hands the destinies of nations makes you worthy of the favors he has bestowed and enable you. With pure hearts and pure hands and sleepless vigilance, to guard and defend to the end of the time the great charge he has committed to your keeping. My own race is nearly run. Advanced age and failing health warn me that before long I must pass beyond the reach of human affairs. I thank God that my life has been spent in the land of liberty, and that he has given me a heart to love my country with the affection of a son. And filled with gratitude for your constant and unwavering kindness, I bid you a last and affectionate farewell. Thank you.